to be in a representative democracy. I mean, that's not a totalitarian state can do. But you cannot do it in what's supposed to be a free society. So it's free or it isn't. I would represent to you on the important things it isn't. That's the problem that people need to rise up, not violently, and change that on a lot of things. Uh, including, you know, there's this myth that we have a free market. Well, how can we have a free market if every significant technology since Tesla in the late 1800s has been ruthlessly <coughs> suppressed, up to and including the killing of the inventor, which I know for a fact has happened. People on my team have been threatened. And so, you know, at a certain point, you have to realize this sort of a sub rosa fascism, as opposed to the overt buffoonish fascism of Adolf Hitler, has to be called out for what it is and changed. But it isn't going to be something that just happens by itself. Those folks are not going to give up that power. But in, in, in any of the representative democracies that are supposed to abide by the rule of law, these operations are, by any definition, illegal. And if they're illegal, the folks who are in those compartments, and usually these guys don't know. Because here's the nature of TSSCI, Top Secret Special Compartmented Intelligence. The one person has a little piece and another, and they're all in compartments. And the left hand doesn't even know the right hand exists. So what I'm saying is that we need to find people in those compartments and inform them of this fact and say, if you've been involved in these operations, you are not bound by the security oaths because those security oaths are also written into law, but the law itself has been vitiated by the programs that are breaking the law. So this gets into basic contract law. Let's say that uh, you know this gentleman is a, a head of the mafia. I know you're not, and I enter into a contract with him. If he's running an illegal operation, that contract is vitiated. There's no enforceability. This is basic law in any country that has laws. Therefore, since that group is illegal, and this is what I'm calling for, I'm calling for a mass defection from inside these operations. There's another whole wave of disclosure, in other words, of mass defections. Because it's too late for us to do a piecemeal. And they need to understand, if they do it, they need to listen to every word I share. That, and, and I will come to their aid, as I try to, to Gary McKinnon, who hacked into the Pentagon. Because while the act was illegal, the hacking, what he was accessing were projects in and of themselves that were illegal projects. And since they were illegal projects, they weren't covered by the law, including the hacking laws. So as I said, his attorney had it all upside down in how he argued that case. It, should, it, would, it would have been point, set, match if they'd said, here's our argument, it's a constitutional argument, and we, I would have given a list of people who could be subpoenaed. And these are, I mean, you get the drift of the, some of the folks. And that's, you know, and there are a lot of people who are victims of this secrecy. I mean, you're, everyone has these conspiracy theories. You know, uh, you have uh, uh, Prince Charles here, very interested, and his, his father, Philip very interested in this subject. And both of them subscribed for years to Flying Saucer Review that you know, Gordon Crichton published, who, who was a military intelligence officer. And I know folks who are friends with, with Charles and have always asked for the briefings, like the presidential briefings I put together will go to these folks and they'll take it to Prince Charles. But they were wanting to know because they're pretty much victims of the secrecy too. So a lot of people think they're these grand, or it is a grand conspiracy, but it's not what most people think. And so you have victims, whether it's in royal families, in your uh, military, in your intelligence, in your parliament, and in your 10 Downing Street over here. So, that, uh, Talking about free energy, I, I heard that the Keshe Foundation, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. is really using a zero-point device to power up your house. Now, in September, October, this year. So, I don't know how this concludes. And I, like, well, there are people, I mean, he's asking a question about these zero point and so called free energy. It's kind of a misnomer. None of them violate the laws of thermodynamics. You have to understand that it was proven decades ago by a person, Dr. Casimir, that there is a zero point field, and it's estimated that a cubic centimeter of space, not outer space, but space in this room, has enough energy to, to run the United States for a week, maybe a year, but a long time, and a huge amount of power density. So that's been proven scientifically in mainstream physics journals. The question is, can it be accessed? The answer is yes. 
Now, there are all kinds of things on the internet about so-and-so has one, and my group, the, the Serious Technology Advanced Research, which is now the umbrella for the Orion Project, which does the energy research, CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and the Disclosure Project, has a $100,000 award to anyone who can actually deliver something that, like that that we can then release open source, cannot be patented, cannot have a trade secret, it must be fully reproducible, and it would be released massively. And when I say massively, 800 million people saw the National Press Club Disclosure event globally. This would be three times that. I, probably, I guarantee that. But no, so far, no one's come to us with something that is meets the criteria, can be independently reproduced, and tested, proven, only from plants. It has no secrets. Like Rossi has this thing, you all know, in Italy, National Security Agency contacts I have have said they're very interested in it because they think it's real. The problem is he's keeping it a trade secret. It's going to be like Stan Meyer's water fuel car. It's going to go to the grave with him if he doesn't change his strategy. I'm making a prediction here. Anyone who tries to keep something like this and purely for monetizing it and for a trade secret and patent, it's not like inventing an iPhone, you know, a piece of junk. It's, it, so, I mean, I'm saying, sorry, Apple. I mean, it's just junk. I mean, it's made in a slave factory in China, $54 for something you pay 800 pounds for, for $800. For. In reality, all that is very ordinary technology. You come up with something like this that's going to change the macroeconomic system. You really change something then. And so it can't be done in a conventional technology rollout. It has got to be open source. Put out to the public. Now, this is very hard for inventors to hear because they may have put a lot of work into it. They say, well, how can then I be compensated? Believe me, how many brands of Kleenex are there? Or Coca Cola's? Or uh, Xerox machines? Well, there are a zillion copier machines now. There, you know, there could still be a way, and just like the is it Linux or the, the operating system, you know. There are ways to do it, and there could still be a way to monetize it, but if you go to patent route, it's going to be seized. If you go the trade secrecy route, it will not be able to be replicated quickly enough before it gets hoovered up, vacuumed up by the intelligence community and squashed. And, um, and if, if, you know, or worse, which of course there are a number. You know, we had a guy under contract in 2010 to build uh, one of these over unity free energy systems. And he had been cleared by the intelligence community to do it. Five of the shepherds, so called shepherds in the intelligence community, that were holding his security clearance and said, Yes, you can do this for Dr. Greer and the Orion Project. We gave him the grant. About the time he was assembling the thing together, he got visited by a former CIA director, the one I had briefed. R. James Woolsey and a bunch of henchmen who threatened him and his wife and his family and shut it down. So he took our, he had our funds and we got in the system. This is why we're not going to do that. It has to come to us and be completely operational and reproducible. In other words, if you leave out the secret ingredient of how it works, which if you look at Stan Meyer's patents on the fuel energy water car, None of them are accurate. The, it, the voltages and the hertz, cycles per second, are all incorrect. He deliberately left out the magic of how it works, which of course vitiates the patent, but also means he took it to his grave. Except his twin brother Steve, who we met with, understands that he's afraid of being assassinated. Therefore, we either have to get people to fund an energy lab, because we really do understand how these systems work, but I, you know, I'm not a mechanical or electrical engineer. And I think probably, you know, I have a disk with several thousand patents that the CIA seized on a disk. I have it. But, you know, it's, it's two-dimensional. To build it up is a research project. But it's in our vault. We have it. Anyone want to fund a lab? We've got a $10 million extra dollars laying around to open a research lab. Let's do it. I don't have that kind of money, but some people might, so it can be done. Or someone could like these groups have to bring something to us that we can then move across the goal line. If it's handled in any other way, it can't, you know, most of these end up being black boxes, these technology. And when you try to drill down on what is it actually doing, how is it working, oh, I can't tell you that. All right, and it, in which case it's either a fraud or they're strategically immature 
and they're going to go down. I mean, it ain't going to happen. So our strategy is to get something that is legitimate and can be scientifically tested, reproduced independently by multiple people, and once we know it's legitimate, boom, it's pushed out over the internet. If we had our own laboratory funded, everything in that lab would be streamed in real time on the internet. That's what we do. And people want to come in and shut that down? Oh, your own candid camera. Very, very big mistake. Uh, one more question, and then we're going to go and just uh, hang out together a little bit. Let's see, uh, back here at the blue shirt, gentlemen. Okay, there, I don't talk about other people, but I will talk about ideas. Uh, it's just ethically, I don't do it. Um, I think it's important to understand that there is a, a secret space program. You know, by the time we landed on the moon with my uncle's lunar module, they already had 15, 14 years, 15 years earlier, anti grabs that were flying around. Now, that is true. But then what happens is there are people who say, oh, yeah, I've been to this star system and back. And, those are great claims, prove it. So I need to either have multiple independent corroborating individuals and documents and et cetera for me to buy that. My understanding is that there are, in fact, um, a secret space force, but it doesn't go too far out there because the interstellar civilizations don't want. In fact, I had a meeting not long ago, a couple years ago, with this a senior naval research lab scientist who had come in out of a briefing with a general at the Defense Intelligence Agency that had just been shown images of a massive interstellar craft out around near the rings of Saturn. And it was interesting, he didn't know that one of the executives at Lockheed Martin that was running the Cassini probe had called me to give me the same information. And, and apparently this space center is in the order of dozens to hundreds of miles in diameter. My military advisor for many years was at NORAD, North American Air Defense Command, and was in a um, Console 50, is what it was called back then, that tracked the interstellars and interplanetaries. And he said that at that time, back in the 70s, that there was, they had tracked an object out in deep space that, in our solar system though, that was 26 miles in diameter. And it's like the whole diameter across the city of London. Uh, floating out there. Um, and he said, his Navy guy said, floating under its own steam, moving under its own steam. I said, I don't think they're using steam. <laughs> <laughs> Navy guy, you know, is thinking steam. But um, so, yes, that part, you know, so there are interstellar objects out there, and there are man made electromagnetic robotics that can go a certain point. But my understanding is that we're not allowed to just go way out there. And the reason for it is that we're not considered civilized yet. Um, if you doubt it, come to a, an emergency department with me in America on any Saturday night uh, or whatever. I mean, it, it's not hard to figure out that until humans begin to live at a level one civilization, that Michi, Michikaku calls a level one, we're simply not going to be allowed to go very far out there. So I'm skeptical of some of the claims. So yes, we have a secret Air Force and a secret Space Force, but I think sometimes the stories get a little bit embellished and get too far. Well, look, I would love to thank all of you guys for being here. You're a wonderful group. It's a little after 9. We have to be completely cleared out of the building by 10. So we're going to go to this other place. If you want to hang out a little bit, I can sign some books if you brought one. Uh, but we need to start moving in that direction. Thank you so much. Everybody.